Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From the City of Angels in Los Angeles and typically from New York, but my co-host Adrian Gruberg is ill today or at a doctor appointment. So anyway, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver, coming to you live on 26 global and audio video platforms, platforms like iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher Radio. There's just way too many to to name. In fact, we're proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast out of the top 50 on Player FM and number two on Feedspot out of the top 60 and also number two on CaringVillage.com. And we have an especially exciting show planned for you today. How to understand our own needs. Chris Shaver is the couple's whisperer and the founder of Couples Institute. He's on a mission to help save 100 million couples from divorce. That's a big vision. Uh, or even painful breakups using couples assessment that pinpoints the exact reasons they get tripped up and gives them research proven advice on how to restore love and connection. Chris is the author of the upcoming book, A Marriage Cure, The Proven Way to Restore Your Love. And there's no greater need for restored marriages than spousal caregivers. So that's why I have them on the show. But before we get started, I do want to take this moment and thank my last week's guest, Ron Kanur, certified leadership coach, speaker, and devoted husband to Beth for 40 years. And the last three years was in the storm of a cancer trial. And just to remind you, you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews on our membership website, caregiverdave.com or any of the other 26 global networks I mentioned earlier. Okay, enough of that. Chris, welcome to the Caregiver Dave Show. We're so excited to have you on. Dave, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. And Chris, I always like to ask my guests just who is Chris Shaver and why was he placed on this earth? That's it. <laughs> I've never been asked that question before. Uh, <laughs> Maybe that's why I ask it. <laughs> why well, I've been placed on this earth. Yeah, I, you I have think a, a placed, purpose, a mission, a destiny, a fulfillment. Yeah, I think I've been placed on this earth to, to help people understand each other. Um, from my youngest age, um, I actually remember uh, having the Bible read to me, and the quote was, Judge not unless you be judged. And from a very young age, I understood that we were judging each other all the time and, <laughs> and that we might need some help with that one. And the, the older I got, the more I, that's in every major religion on earth. That's not just in the Christian Bible, it's in the Old Testament, it's in the Quran, it's everywhere. And so when I stumbled across uh, the Berkman Method, which is a profoundly accurate way of understanding who we are individually and how we relate, I felt like I, I'm, I'm now able to actually accomplish or set out to accomplish that mission that I sort of set for myself a long time ago. That's great. Now you call yourself the couple's whisperer be, because there's a horse whisperer and there's a dog whisperer. So <laughs> I'm assuming you uh, <laughs> know how to train couples <laughs> to behave. <laughs> well, uh, I use something called the Berkman method, which measures 22 pairs of opposite behaviors that can trip couples up or tear them apart. Yeah. And, 22 and of them, huh? Yeah, there's, I would say there's, there's 22, there's maybe more on earth, but what Roger Berkman with his empirical research, he teased out these 22 things and it's a very articulate way about, of understanding who we are individually and then how we interact as you know, pairs or even collectively families, teams, whatever. And the Berkman method was uh, written to help people at work. And my expertise in, is in translating that back to personal relationships. Well, I've got a bunch of questions here for you, but I think we can do the whole show on just uh, going through the 22 <laughs> problems. What do you recommend? <laughs> uh, let's let's take your agenda. I, I'd love to talk to your audience about what their concerns are. <laughs> All right. So um, 
you have a story. What did your story teach you about the struggles that can really impact the lives of caregivers? Because this ain't your first rodeo. You were a caregiver or? Uh... I was. My my wife of, uh, at that time, 27 years, had a major mental and physical health breakdown. Oh, my. And was hospitalized three times, each time worse than the one previous. And she came out of that ultimately um, with a kind of a mental health assessment and would go through six uh, and at the last 14 month bouts of deep depression. And wow. yeah, so sitting on the couch and uh, not really able to do much for those long periods of time. And if you're around somebody who's depressed, it's bloody hard not to become depressed yourself, which I yeah. did. Clinically depressed. Was yeah. there was there an event or a uh, something that caused all of that, or did it just happen out of nowhere? Well, she she had been anorexic as a teen, and there was a predictor that that would equal some sort of major event in her early fifties, apparently. And the timing was just about that. She was recovered from that uh, earlier. Yes, yeah, yes, she was actually. Really, was, that was its own kind of miracle that. Um, she had come across the the doctor at uh, University of Pennsylvania Hospital, who was the first ever sort of successfully treat people from anorexia. So we had a wonderful life, but we went through that. And uh, but then coming out on the other side, and having to be her caregiver for those long periods of time, um, and about ten years in, I ha I kind of discovered the Berkman method. And one of the things I say it measures twenty two pairs of opposite behaviors. One of the categories of those behaviors is actually strong interests. And we can have very strong interests that sort of guide and motivate us. There are joy in life. We can also have extremely weak uh, uh, connections to those interests, which I, so I would call them more like antipathies, hence uh -huh. like the opposite nature of interest. Sometimes they can be things you really don't want to do at all. They're extremely demotivating. But um, my Berkman measured my musical interest at a 99%, meaning that my interest in music was higher than 99% of the 50 million people who had taken the Berkman. And sitting there and the kind of my own profound depression from having been caretaking my wife for too long, <laughs> I realized that if I didn't get out of that chair, I was probably gonna die one way or the other. It was right. you know, just as far close to the bottom as you can get without touching it. Um, and I realized I, that interests are powerful. They're like the North Star. They're the place where your joy resides on this planet. Yeah. And I thought, I know that, you know, from that depth, I thought, I just need to get up and start listening to music. I went to YouTube, found two or three songs I connected with and actually started to write a musical. And I, wow. I've never written a musical before, but I, I used that to climb out of that depression, one rung of that ladder at a time. And it was music that rescued me, but ultimately it was my uh, accurate personality yeah. assessment that gave me the map that I could use to find joy again. So, yeah, it was pretty pretty powerful moment in my life when I realized how important that was. Well, something you said uh, brings up two questions in my mind. The first one is, um, did she uh, try antidepressants? Nothing would help. And the second question was, you mentioned that someone said that if you dealt with uh, anorexia at an early age, that later on in your 50s, uh, it's a marker for depression. Is that is that true? Well, to answer the second one first, apparently it is true. I'm not an expert in that subject. But she would, um, my wife would never take any medication up until the point of practically dying. And she had been in a car accident in her early 20s, lost a kidney, mm -hmm. and had this fear of taking medication because they all had uh, bad effects on kidneys. This is what she said. But so she would never take any medication other than she would go like a whole month without sleeping. And at that point, she'd take some sort of a med, pull her out of it. But other than that, would never medicate. Yeah, I have a cousin who struggled with um, anorexia. And I don't know, I think she's about 50 or so. I, I, I need to ask her if she's been suffering from depression. And if she is, uh, that that could probably be the reason, huh? 
Well, yeah, I, I don't know the, what the connection or the correlation is or how that works, whether it's some biochemical time bomb waiting to go off. I honestly don't know and uh, never really <sighs> looked into that aspect of it farther, except it was just the chap, the psych, uh, psychiatrist who um, gave us a sort of little tour of what had happened on the way out the door, mentioned that. And, you know, it had never, never been said before. I, wow. My ex never knew about it. Yeah, I never heard it. Yeah, me neither. And, um, well, you said that your depression, you believe, was caused by just being a caregiver and burning out and, and um, realizing that uh, you couldn't help your wife. I mean, you said antidepressants, nothing helped. Well, nothing did help her, and I think I do think one of the hardest things, it, honestly, if you're in in the presence of somebody who's struggling, um, there there is this psychological research about um, I'm trying to remember what the term is exactly, but the, the essence of it is is that the strongest emotional state in the room is contagious, and and if others are exposed to it long enough, and that could be positive, not just negative, but other people will start to resonate to whatever that strongest emotional state is. And that was my experience of being around depression is no matter how I tried to sort of keep myself up in the presence of that for months and months and months on end, I felt myself get dragged down. I was not able to escape, you know, that gravity. Well, that's good. Um, have you tried the um, the music therapy on your wife? Did that bring her out of her depression? No, actually, you know, Dave, we ended up getting divorced. One oh. of the <laughs> yeah, sorry one, about that. No, that's fine. I think one of the um, yeah, I I I don't know. I, I my the hard truth that I had to face up to as a caregiver is that I couldn't help her. Sure. And it actually got to the point where I thought, well, maybe I am part of the problem. So I, I asked her, I told her that if she wasn't going to medicate that we needed to split up and it was her mm. choice and she made that choice. That's right. You said she didn't want the, um, the medication. Right. So let me ask you another question. Um, you talk about the structured path for change that most couples in trouble come to. Um, how can this be identical to caregivers uh, the caregiver's journey that they find themselves on? Well, I think that a caregiver's journey ultimately is about understanding each other's needs. And um, every, every caregiver's journey is a different journey in some sense because the needs can be dramatically uh, physical needs. In other words, there can you can be just taking care of somebody who you're basically just managing to keep them alive. Uh -huh. um, and so human beings have a range of needs, right? We have yeah. a, a need to breathe, and that can be a very real need in a caregiver relationship is just make sure that, you know, you're, whoever you're caring for is continuing to breathe. They can be, you know, helping them walk or can, you know, stay mobile or turning them in bed. There's all sorts of like very basic needs that may have to be met in that caregiver's relationship, but it is about caring for needs. And at the same time, what I do for a living and what I help couples understand is that we also have needs of our personality. And that's also, that can be like a tricky thing for people because they could say, well, you know, if I don't breathe, I die but you're saying I have needs of personality. If if you're treating me poorly, I don't die. But, but the common thread is that um, in both cases, there's a trigger. And so if I'm not breathing, there's going to be commotion. There's going to be, you know, there will be a consequence. And the, the same will happen as if you're not treating me correctly. There, I, I will have that trigger. I will have a rush to judgment in my head. And what actually Berkman's research found, Berkman's research um, was set out to answer the question, why do people, why do people's behaviors change from their good behavior to bad behavior? Why do you go from talking calmly perhaps to yelling or from you know, talking calmly to just turning around and leaving the room? And those triggers actually are behavioral triggers. 
Mm. So in a caregiver's relationship, both parties have to have their needs met. Now, sometimes you're in a caregiver relationship where the person you're caring for can't meet your needs at all. They might not really be present in, in that sense of a relationship. So you have to meet your own needs. Yeah. Sometimes they are, you, they are in a relationship with you. They just might be having, you know, intense struggles, but they still should understand that there's a two way street and needs have to be met on both sides. So whether it's a couple, you know, married couple or a couple in a caregiver relationship, understanding the needs of both parties um, is the core to making sure that, you know, you might not, you might not be <laughs> achieving bliss in that caregiver relationship, but you can certainly not, you can certainly be taking care of your needs as best you can. So you stay motivated and don't, you know, in my, in my situation, I didn't understand how to take care of my own needs and mm -hmm. I got depressed and I was worthless. So it's the needs are the core common thread between caregivers and couples in any relationship, the needs are the core of it. So you bring up something interesting. Well, by the way, I, I was texting my cousin and asked her if she ever suffered depression uh, because of her anorexia. And she says, absolutely. So there's something that I learned today. Yeah. Um, and her, their daughters have been diagnosed as well. So there's a time bomb waiting for them. Um, I wanted to ask you something and it, it slipped my mind, but it'll come back here in a second. Uh, oh, I know what it was. You, um, if you knew now what you knew then, what would you have done differently? Because here you are, it's ironic. It's like the shoemaker who needs shoes or the, the marriage counselor who was divorced, you know, which is kind of what you are. Um, is there anything that you could have done differently given that your wife was not willing or able to change that would have you still in the relationship? Yeah, I, I think what happened when she came out of that relationship, we'd been married 27 years prior to that. Mm -hmm. And we, in the first month of our time together as a married couple, we had mm -hmm. one fight where we yelled at each other, one fight where we yelled at each other. After she came out and her behavior was... When she wasn't depressed, she would come out of it in a mania and she was often agitated <clears throat> and angry. And in that state, we fought loudly all the time. And I had no, I had never been in a relationship with somebody who triggered me like that. So the one thing that I would have done clearly would be to understand those triggers and to be able to back away from them because it's one of the first things that you get um, in Berkman is again, the research was why do we go from being calm and peaceful to the bad behavior side of ourselves? So okay. it's the trigger. If somebody gives, if somebody, um, she would be often be um, loud and assertive and overly aggressive with me. And my reaction in that triggered state, I'm a pretty calm guy. <laughs> and my need is for you to come at me calmly, have a calm conversation. Right. If you come at me assertively, my trigger takes me to the exact opposite of what would normally be predicted for me. And I become aggressive and I will match that behavior and I will double it. I will double, I will triple it. I'll look like a lion roaring at you and I won't back down. And so the, the state of being is sort of called um, competition, uh, competition with winning. So, yeah, or, or another word for that is Trumpian. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it can be. You hit me, I'm going to hit you. Dominating. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's yeah. dominating. It's dominating. You know, my wife, my wife had a stroke uh, 25 years ago, and the the first two years was really like that. She was going through the grief process, going through a lot of anger, going through a lot of depression, which the depression was chemically not only depressed because of her state, because she couldn't talk and she couldn't walk, but chemically, you know, so. Uh, and we almost broke up because, you know, I, I'm a calm guy like you and I don't really need a lot, just a few crumbs I'll be happy with. And I wasn't even getting the crumbs, you know, no love, no appreciation, just anger. And, you know, I wrote her a letter saying, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to do this. And, 
And I didn't give it to her because, you know, I couldn't, but it, it, I felt better writing it. But then I went to a support group, learned that I had to take care of me first. So I started just taking care of me, you know, going on weekend trips to relatives out of state. And after a while, she slowly, you know, found her God again and started reinventing herself and saw that her anger wasn't affecting me. And, well, you know, our love was rekindled and we fell in love again. And, and now... 47 years later, we're still together and we're still happy. But um, if she didn't change, you know, I, I frankly, I don't know what would happen. I, I don't think I would subject myself to that. So I can, I can certainly understand and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Empathize with you. Yeah. Well, yeah, changes, changes the thing. because mm -hmm. it, And one of us had to change. So when I found my Berkman and, uh, found Berkman and, and saw the prediction that if somebody were to come at me too assertively, I would match them. Yeah. I, I sort of. You still do that? The, pardon me? Now that you understand all this, do you still do it? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. If somebody, if somebody <laughs> does that, I understand the trigger. And normally what I would yeah. just say would be, hey, I just got triggered. That landed kind of rough. And here's what my need is. The, the, the real benefit of Berkman is now. I'm conscious of the trigger, and now I can articulate it consciously <clears throat> and say, if you keep coming at me like that, I'm just going to have to leave the room because... You can't be responsible, wanna, right? Yeah, you don't want to see what, what <laughs> I look like if you keep this up because it's not pretty, and I don't want to feel it. I don't so now the ball's in their court. Yeah, well, <sighs> it's conscious relating at that point, right? Sure, I mean, sure. you, you were conscious in your relationship. You just said, hey, I can't do this. I need to leave the room. That was a conscious choice. I need to go on trips. But I think all of those things, I, I don't know why I did not have that awareness that I had that trigger, but man, did that trigger get tripped a hundred times if it got tripped once. Yeah. So let's talk about, you, you mentioned three specific things that caregivers will get from understanding their needs better. Yeah, number, number one is your needs um for either behaviors from others or your needs around your interests are the source of what motivates you towards happiness so understanding your needs and your interests are give you the roadmap towards taking care of yourself in other words your story was all about how do i take care of myself and sometimes like me i just got thrown off the edge of a cliff i felt like in my life and i did not have a roadmap you know, I was wandering in the wilderness. So I think that's the first thing is you get, you get a roadmap for what makes you happy. And the second thing I think is that um, if you can communicate your needs, once you understand your needs, if you're in some sort of a relationship, some way to be able to communicate your needs to establish something that's more equitable so that like your wife could hear what you were saying, perhaps like, this doesn't work for me, but this would work for me. Now you're in a, pl in a place where you can set boundaries, where you can both presumably understand boundaries, hopefully. And again, if it's just you in that space, and because you're caring for somebody who really can't communicate back with you, you're still in a communication with yourself. And sometimes that that disparity between, I, 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 I my sister always says, I sat down and gave myself a lecture. And so <laughs> I'm under, I, and I'm aware of that, right? There's, there's the part of you that wants to sort of like bip around all day long and just do your thing. And then there's the part of you that's conscious. Oh, oh. So even if the relationship relationship is between you and yourself, then you can re establish a more equitable, equitable relationship that is more conscious and guiding you towards your own personal happiness. Um, and the last thing I, I just want to, I would reiterate this 20 times if I could, but your strong interest, which is one of the things you would learn from taking Berkman, your oh. strong interests are your North star in life. And that is what, that is where your happiness comes from. And if you can figure out what they are, what those strong interests might be and pursue them as though your life depended on it, like I did, you will take one step at a time towards <clears throat> a much happier life. Well, that must be what I'm doing. I'm writing books. I'm speaking on stages, traveling the country. Um, I'm, uh, they're making a, a movie about our life now. It's 
that that satisfies me, you know. So I'm I'm happy. I'm content. And uh, regardless of what my wife does, she she supports me, so that's good. But well, I assume that this um, this assessment would be beneficial to caregivers and care receivers uh, if they were to take it. Yes. Yeah, I think it's beneficial to anybody, honestly, Dave, and, and the caregiver care receivers certainly. That relationship has some very interesting oh, power yeah. dynamics. Um, the people who yeah. need care are in a weaker spot. And the people who are giving care um, presumably have more power, but they're in some ways in a weaker spot because oh. they're not leaving the life they have. They want to leave. So I just think yeah. adding conscious understanding of what you all both need and having conversations around that transforms a relationship from something where you're just kind of grinding on each other. Um, what the research shows about couples in general is that if they're able to have meta conversations about the relationships, in other words, we're not just talking about the content, but we're able to take a step up and say, um, what we're doing here, how are we doing what we're doing? And when you're talking about things on the behavioral level, it's like, oh, if you talk to me that way, it triggers this inside of me. So we should probably learn how to structure conversations so that you come at me this way and I can respond that way. Now we're talking about the relationship and not about the content. Having that level of control is like getting a steering wheel on a car that never had one. So it's, I think it's profoundly important for people to understand that this exists and it's very simple to take an assessment and to really start to understand who you are and who your other is and where you both meet and how you'll meet successfully in spite of whatever, you know, yeah. pitfalls or trials have been put in front of you. So two questions. Um, how's your ex-wife doing now? And number two, I'm assuming you still have a need of, of romance and a companionship. And uh, have you met someone new? Yeah, my, my ex seems to be doing okay, although she still goes through bouts of depression. She's single? She is single. Um, she lives nearby. I I don't see her frequently. I saw her this summer at, at my son's wedding, and um, she still has her cycle of going through those depressions, and she still won't medicate. But How does she survive being alone uh, through the depression? She has good friends. Yeah, she has good friends, Support and uh, it's it. It hasn't, um, to my knowledge, gotten life threatening again, which it had at times. So, you know, I I don't know whether our relationship was additional pressure that added to that or what, but she's still alive and well, thankfully. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's better to separate. You know, if the if it's just you know opposites uh, opposite polarities etc so how's your new relationship or no well yeah i i am in a relationship that's uh going on two years old now and actually with laura and um <clears throat> on the, yeah, right after the first date i asked laura if she would take the assessment and i could tell she was you know taken aback like this is not <laughs> romance at its finest but I said, uh, you know, I said, that's right up there with um, uh, prenup agreements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Would you sign a prenup agreement? No. <laughs> I, I said, Here's the thing, though. It, when you're in a relationship, a brand new relationship, something called dating behavior applies. And it's kind of like uh, we're, we're all good at modifying our behavior. We can all put on our best public face. Like my parents used to say when we're going to church, now be on your good behavior. Well, dating behavior can last for two Ooh. years. And what I said to Laura was, I really don't want to know your dating behavior. I want to know the real you. And I think we can have a relationship based on that. And we can escape the trap of when we come out of dating behavior and we see each other and we think, oh, this is who this person is. I, do, I didn't sign up for that. And I said, it's okay. If, if we don't get along with our real behavior, I'm fine with that. I just don't want to fall in love with somebody who you're not. Right. That's good. I, I just looked at the clock. We Time flies when you're having fun. We've run out of time. What uh, in the next few seconds um, would you like to say uh, to our caregivers? Some closing thoughts and how to contact you. And uh, well, yeah, um, you can you can reach me at couplewhisper.com. 
And I've got a free report that I give away called How to Survive the 22 Pairs of Opposite Behaviors. And you can uh, reach out to me at chris at coupleswhisper.com if you'd like to take an assessment and like to understand how you can use this powerful, transforming, life-changing information in your own life. And I'd be happy to help you. And if you could leave caregivers with one piece of advice, what would that be? Know thyself. That's a good one. Know thyself. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And just a reminder that all our live shows become recorded podcasts and video casts on all our platforms that I mentioned earlier. And don't forget to check out my membership website, caregiverdave.com, where you can purchase my number one new release book, Secrets from the Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times. It's a great book about wisdom that is changing lives. And I would encourage you, Chris, if uh, you can purchase it wherever books are sold. And Caregiver Dave is a free membership support group with lots of tools, resources, and free gifts, as well as my Facebook page with the same name. And remember to click or like the follow or uh, whatever platform you are watching or listening to on this uh, interview. It helps Google prove their search engine algorithm. So again, all my listeners out there all over the world, thank you so much for tuning into us every Wednesday and making us the number one caregiver podcast on the internet on your favorite platform. So until next week, same channel. May God richly bless you. Bye-bye. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers, but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live Weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. You can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we're here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Oh.